So there's been a huge wave of projects looking for these transits. It sounds pretty easy. You just photograph stars repeatedly and look for very small dips in brightness every now and then. You're involved in one with uh, Dan Bryan. Is it as easy as that? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that can make a star dip in the way that mimics a planet. And so we have to worry about getting rid of things, for example, of two stars, a bigger and a smaller one orbiting, where you just sort of clip the edge of the one star uh, with the other. Turns out that puts a little dip, and the reason why the dip is so small is because you just clip a little bit of one star with the other. So we have to get rid of that effectively by looking at the velocity of the star because this system will have a much bigger radial velocity change. So it's a lot easier than measuring with you know, the way you find planets so you can get rid of that type of thing. But there are other problems as well. So in this case, we have uh, an eclipsing binary again where the star really gets eclipsed. But there's another star that is behind or in front. And of course, when we look through the Earth's atmosphere, one pixel is like, you know, much, much bigger than the screen. So you're averaging or adding up everything that you see here. So these two, just by themselves, are making quite big dips because they're big yep. things passing in front of each other. But because their light is diluted by the star over here, it makes it look very small. Right. And so that's a real problem. And so there's a couple ways we can get rid of this. One way is just to make sure, it, you know, that, uh, for example, all, you know, that the star that we're looking at uh, doesn't look like two or three different stars. The other one to make sure is that this star isn't a giant star because it turns out that when you're looking for transits, a giant star has a huge radius compared to the planet. And so you just can't see transiting planets in front of giant stars. So how many candidate planet things do you see and what fraction of them turn out to be real planets? So the fraction that we're having to get rid of, it's, it's almost 100 to 1 in the end. I mean, we're able to pretty quickly get it down to sort of 10 to 1. But in the end, we have to go through and do radial velocities of the transiting objects we see to be confident that they are planets. So this is a bit of a nasty surprise. It looked like a great method. You could do it with small telescopes. And the trouble is, because there's this huge contamination of things like this, you had to actually still go to the big telescope for the follow-up. So huge amounts of big telescope time once again required to follow all these things up. But it's been done. Uh, it's continuing to be done. And here now is our discovery chart, once again showing the mass of the planets against the orbit. And now we're going to start showing red dots for the ones discovered using the transit method. There's the first one. And what you can see is these things are primarily hot Jupiters. Right, but you should realize it's not that suddenly we've discovered a bunch of missing hot Jupiters. It's just that this method is really good at finding objects here in the diagram, and it's really bad at finding objects down here. And the basic reason for that is, let's imagine that you know, Brian's head is a star, and we've got a planet going around it over here. If it's close in, if it's edge on, it'll cause a transit. It can actually be at quite an angle and still cause a transit. But if it's way out over here, it doesn't have to be very far aligned before it goes above or below Brian's head. Right. So basically the probability of seeing a transit goes down quite steeply as you go further out, simply because the odds of it being edge on enough to go in front becomes very, very small. So, Paul, we can find all these kind of wacko hot Jupiters. We already knew they existed. Um, it seems, well, I won't say it's pointless, but uh, it's not obvious why it's so interesting. Well, why it's interesting, I mean, yes, we knew hot Jupiters existed, but now we actually know the mass, not just M psi and I, because it's got to be pretty much edge on. But more important, we actually know the radius for these things. Uh, we were always assuming when we called these things hot Jupiters that they were gas giants, like Jupiter, with a density of about you know, 1,000 kilograms per cubic metre. But maybe they were actually giant rocky planets. In our own solar system, the things of the mass of Jupiter are, there's only one of them, and it's got made of gas primarily, low density. But maybe there could be massive things that are more like the Earth, the density of like 5,000 kilograms per cubic metre. So how can we tell? Well, here's a plot of the transiting objects. What we're plotting here is their radius in units of Jupiter radius. That's one Jupiter radius. And up here is the mass in all units of Jupiter mass. There's Jupiter. There's Saturn and Neptune. And this line here is what you'd expect for something that's primarily made of gas. So about Jupiter's composition. And these... Uh, error bars up here in purple are the actual planets we're seeing. So you can see that there is an object that looks about like Jupiter. Um, 
but most of the objects are a lot bigger radius. And remember, the volume goes as the cube of the radius. So being a bit bigger means you're a lot less dense. You really are puffed up. This is the first big surprise. It looks like these things are actually mostly, not all, but mostly considerably bigger than you'd expect from their mass. Um, so these things are very low density. So actually, incredibly low densities. Some of these things up here. I mean, Saturn actually is low enough density it would float if you had a really big bathtub. These things are more like the Apollostarian type densities, incredibly low. Oh, so we do know that they're very near to the stars. So maybe they're being puffed up by the fact that they're close to their stars. Well, this was the first idea people had. You take gas, how do you make it low density? Heat it up. As it heats up, it becomes less dense. So these things are very close in. So just how hot are these hot Jupiters anyway? Now if you remember, a while back we derived an equation for the temperature of a planet in equilibrium. We balanced the radiation in from the Sun with the radiation out, assuming it absorbed and emitted perfectly and was all the same temperature, which is not very realistic. And we found out that the temperature is the fourth root of the luminosity of the star all over. 16 pi Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma and d squared where d is the distance between the star and the planet. So we can use this to work out the temperature of a hot Jupiter. Let's do an example. So let's say we have a solar luminosity star. So in that case that's the luminosity of the Sun. Um, let's assume it's 0.05 AU out. Then if we plug numbers in, we end up with a temperature of around 1240 Kelvin. So pretty hot. If the star is less luminous and the planet's far away, the temperature will be less. So Paul, to explain why these objects are so much less dense than Jupiter, and you kind of expect Jupiter to be how a planet would form, you would think, uh, let's plot it as a function of temperature and have a look at what we see uh, because that's one possible idea to explain things. So here we have the planet radius versus the planet temperature and there does seem to be an effect. You can also see the symbols here indicate for example the size or the abundance of elements in these planets and it doesn't seem to correlate with any of those. It really looks like temperature is driving it. So problem solved isn't it? Well, it's, yeah, it's, to me it seems like that uh, if you're going to shine heat onto the planet, it'll puff up because that's the way gas is. You heat it up, it puffs up. But there may be a problem. Yeah, I mean, the trouble is that um, we think of a planet like, for example, Saturn, a gas giant like this. Here's an optical picture. But if you look at it in the infrared, it looks much more evil. Um, when these things formed, you had a big cloud of gas that shrank and shrank and shrank until it formed these things, much like when a star forms. In the process, a huge amount of heat was generated in the middle. And it turns out that for gas giants, the seed is still mostly there. The inside, as you can see from this infrared image, is glowing intensely. The middle of the star is much, much hotter than the outside. So when we talk about the heat coming in from the outside, um, warming it up, I mean, it might be quite hot on the outside, a thousand degrees or so, but that's nothing to the heat in the middle already. So it's very hard to see how anything you can do to the outside of the star. That might only affect the outer half a percent or so, but the middle of the star is so hot anyway, it's almost not going to care what's going on out there. So we sort of need to somehow get what's going on on the outside into the inside somehow. Or... And this is currently very controversial. Here's three possible models for what's going on. If you remember earlier on we talked about when the thing might have started off in an elliptical orbit and had huge tides raised when it came closer. That's a possibility. Maybe when this thing came close it was pulled out of shape by the intense gravity and as it spun and was pulled out of shape and that stirred everything up and heated up in the middle. So that, that's sort of like what makes Io's volcanoes happen, right? Where Io is getting bent out of shape by Jupiter so it gets heat in its center. So that's one way to do it. A second possibility is that it could be winds. Now we generally think that because of this tidal effect, the planets are always going to face one side towards the star. So let's imagine Brian is the star and I'm going around him. I would always, as I moved around, rotate so I looked at him from the same direction. So that's sort of what the moon does when it goes around the Earth for the same reason. Exactly the same reason. But this means that if I'm staring intensely at the sun, this side of me is going to be very, very hot and that side's going to be pretty cold, which could well drive very strong winds from one side to the other. Uh, we know on Earth the equator is hot and the poles are cold. They're nothing like as much of a difference as we get on these planets. And that drives the winds on the Earth. Maybe some differences can drive winds here.
or maybe they don't. But if you're talking about these very strong winds, once again they're at the surface level, but maybe a very strong wind can dredge up and cause some turbulence and stir up the stuff underneath it and that will stir up the stuff further and further down. So you might have some sort of cascade of turbulence further down to warm it all up. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sounds a little dubious to me. And what about magnetic heating? I mean, we have our friend the magnetic field. I bet you we can do some magic with it here too. So, of course, we know that planets in our own solar system have magnetic fields. Gas giants have very strong magnetic fields. Um, maybe if you have this gas at the top is ionized, um, that means it's going to pull magnetic field lines along with itself, and they will then pull on the stuff inside. So maybe that's a way to communicate maybe the winds at the surface uh, down into the middle. All right. So we have some models here, but maybe not a solution yet.